Good morning and welcome. As we begin our worship this morning, uh, we prepare our hearts for baptism. What a, what a blessing this is today. Uh, as we listen to this beautiful prelude, uh, prepare our hearts.
Good morning. I'll give you a minute to find me. We are blessed this morning to be able to begin our worship service with celebration of baptism. And what a wonderful time it is in the life of this young lady, but also in the life of her family and in the life of our church. It is important for us to celebrate decisions like this, and I can't think of a better way to start a worship service than to celebrate with baptism. And so this morning, I want to welcome Annabella Medina into the water. We visited this actually two weeks ago. And I'm going to have you stand up here on the step because nobody's going to see you otherwise. <laughs> there you go. Can you see? All right. <laughs> this is Annabella Medina. And Annabella, because you have asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, we're here today to baptize you, right? So if you would, stand here and look that way. Because of your decision to follow Jesus and make him Lord and Savior of your life, it is my privilege and honor to baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ready? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in a new life. And as she swims to the side, <laughs> quite impressive breaststroke, by the way. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate a decision to follow you. Lord, to celebrate a changed life. And we know that even at her early age, Lord, she has an understanding of who you are and what you have done for us and her need for you. And so, Lord, I pray that this would be a day that she will remember for the rest of her life, as will her family. And, Lord, I pray that it will be a reminder to us today of the day that we pass through waters just like this. Lord, that it would remind us of our commitment to you, our decision to not just make you Savior, but also to make you Lord. And if there's anyone in this room today who has never made that decision, I pray that this will be an inspiration. Uh, to cause us to truly think about what, uh, what you've done for us and our need for you. Be glorified in all that we do today. In Jesus' name, amen. What a blessing to begin worship this way this morning. Let's stand together as we sing together, Be Thou My Vision. Thou 
Good morning, church family. That's one of my favorite hymns, Be Thou My Vision, because it's just a reminder that he's at the center of it all. He's to be our vision all the time. And that's why we come here. That's why you came to the house of the Lord this morning to give praise and worship to the one true God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you are a visitor this morning, if it's your first time, we are glad to have you here. We're excited to get to meet you. If you'll do us a favor, fill out the little yellow, white, yellow card in front of you and give us some basic information about you. Um, We would love to connect with you to tell you about the different opportunities, ministry aspects that we have here at the church, and just a great place to get involved. Um, With that being said, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and continue our worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are our God, that we can have the freedom and the privilege to come to your house and worship you. God, I pray that that's something we don't take for granted. And Lord, this morning, I pray that your spirit moves through all of us, through the entire worship service, through the songs that we sing to you, through the prayers we pray to you, through the word that we receive from Brian. God, I thank you for everyone that's here, and I pray that you be with those that are not, that couldn't join us this morning. But Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your mercy and grace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, y'all can come on up for children's time. Good morning. I am glad you're here this morning. Um, I have some pretty basic supplies that I bet y'all have at home inside my bag. Let's see. What do I have in here? We have, how many of you have olive oil at your house? Olive oil? You have olive oil? Yeah? Okay. Well, this is going to be part of our object lesson this morning. An object the oil is going to represent worry, okay? Do y'all know what the word worry means? What does the word worry mean? Anybody? What does it mean to worry? Do you know what it means to be anxious? I know y'all hear that word at school sometimes, don't you? You hear anxious. Worry actually means to, um, when you're afraid or concerned, that you don't know what's gonna happen. You're worried about what's gonna happen. You don't know what's coming and you start getting this kind of weird feeling in your stomach or you get scared about what's coming up in the future. Some people call it anxiousness. You're gonna get the jitters a little bit. That's worry, okay? So I've got another bottle in here and this bottle is just water, but it's, got food coloring in it so we could actually see it a little better for the object lesson. Um, And this water for the object lesson is going to represent trust in God. What does it mean to trust in God? What does it mean, Jack? To believe. To believe, that's right. To believe that he's going to take care of everything, right? If you put your trust in God, that means you know that God's going to take care of whatever is coming, right? So you know that you don't have to be afraid because God's going to take care of us. Does God want us to worry or does God want us to trust in him? Absolutely trust in him, right, Millie? That's right. Now, my question is, can you worry about things but also trust in God at the same time? You can Okay, let's see. We're gonna, I'm going to do a demonstration to show you a little bit about it. And um, so I'm going to take this bottle right here, and this is going to represent us, okay? So this empty bottle, we're going to fill it up. Can you hold the microphone for me, Heidi? Okay, we're going to fill it up with trusting in God, because we definitely know we need to trust in God, right? So we're going to put our trust in God. Now, some things happened at school and maybe you start feeling a little funny on the inside and you're like, "Mm, yes, I can pray and ask God, oh, if this oil goes everywhere, that's going to be bad. Okay. 
You can do it? Okay, thanks. Um, So I've got it. Okay, so um, God wants us to trust in him. He does not want us to worry, but sometimes worry creeps in even when we don't want it to, right? Things happen. Um, we, maybe somebody in our family gets sick and we start worrying about, well, what's going to happen if they keep getting sick and what happens if they pass away or what happens if I don't make an A on that test or what happens if my best friend moves away? Things start happening in our life that we don't always have control over. God wants us to trust in him, but sometimes that worry creeps in. Heidi, can you hold the microphone for me again? Thank you. Okay, so if we live a life and we try to have worry and trust in God at the same time, does it mix? Can we still see our trust in God? No, right? It does not work together. If we sit and ponder and think and pray, our trust in God starts showing again but that worry is still weighted and shows in our life. And it's obvious to God, but it's obvious to our relationship to him that we're letting worry get in the way of our life. We're not giving everything to God like he wants us to. Can you read for me Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven, and see what scripture says about that? Right there where it's highlighted. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, petition petition will thanksgiving present your request request to God. God and the peace of God, which surpasses surpasses all understanding understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus that's right thank you so pastor B is going to talk about Abraham and Isaac today and Abraham trusted God to take care of his son Isaac and he's going to talk about how he gave everything Isaac was very important to him And he trusted God that he would provide another sacrifice besides Isaac when they went up to worship God. And he's going to continue talking about that other sacrifice today. So I want you to listen about how Abraham fully trusted in God. And I want you to remember that each day that you need to fully trust in God and not worry about the other things that God's got you, right? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you that we can place our trust in you, that we don't need to worry, that we don't need to be anxious about things, that even when people are sick, that you're taking care of us. You have a plan and a purpose. Help us to trust you in all things. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen.
Stand with us this morning as we bless the Lord, oh my soul. Sing with us. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, today we come and we are reminded of the difference that you have made in our lives. I, I pray that that would be at the forefront of our minds today, that, that you truly shape us and transform us, that you offer us salvation that frees us from the fear of sin, the fear of death, and secures for us a life of, in eternity with you. Remind us today that you have given all for us. Your desire for us and from us is that we do the same, that we give ourselves to you. Be glorified in what we do today. Remind us through your word that you have a plan for us and that we are to pick that up and live our lives truly for you. May we be renewed in that commitment today. Lord Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. I am glad that you are here today. We uh, will continue this two-part series, I would say. Last week we began looking at this story of Abraham and Isaac. And we talked last week about the importance of realizing that we need to lay things down. I, Abraham was willing to lay down the life of his son, and not just that, but, but what it meant, the promise that, that God had made to him that his legacy would live on, that his descendants would outnumber the stars, would outnumber the sands on the seashore. You may remember the story earlier in the text. We won't read this today, but, but Abraham was in his tent, and, and, and God said, Abraham, come out and look up. See the stars. Can you count them? You may remember a couple of years ago, and I'll, I'll refer back to this a couple of times this morning, but in October of 2022, we began to truly think about what God's dream for us was. And we use that text to talk about the fact that God drew Abraham out of his tent and said, look up, look up. God is still calling us to his dream, to look up and see what he has for us. And so God had promised Abraham this legacy and then what we find in chapter 22 of Genesis is that God, God had an experiment. He wanted to see just how serious, how committed Abraham would be to following him, no matter the cost, no matter what, to following him. So I'll read the story again today. Last week, as I said, we talked about this idea of what is it that we need to lay down? What is it that we are holding on to that is other than God? Today, I want us to be thinking about what is it that we need to pick up? What is it that God is calling us to? Verse 1 of chapter 22 in the book of Genesis, Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am. He replied, then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. 
As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. What we see is as we talked about last week, this idea that that Abraham was called by God to do something that didn't make any sense, to give up something that he had prayed for, had had looked forward to, had, had desired with all that was within him that he would have a son, that he would have a legacy. And here God calls him and says, I want you to go and I want you to sacrifice your son. We talked last week about the idea that, that obedience is what God is looking, at, looking for in us, to truly obey him, even when it doesn't make sense, to trust him, to trust that God knows what he's doing, to trust that God knows what is best for you. Do we trust that God knows what is best for us? It's easy to say, sometimes harder to do. And so God tested Abraham. Are you serious about following me? Are you willing to obey even when it means costing you everything? Do you trust that I'm bigger? I pointed out last week that Abraham obviously trusted it. He didn't wait and form a committee. It says he got up the next morning and headed out. When he left his servants and said, the boy and I are going to go on over there and we will worship and then we will come back. He trusted that God was going to provide. He didn't know how. He didn't know if God would provide a different sacrifice. He didn't know if God would just raise Isaac from the dead. He didn't know, but he trusted that God did. So last week, as I said, we talked about this idea of what is it that we need to lay down? What is it that we're holding on to that is other than God, that's taking the place of God? It might be something, it might be someone, it might just simply be that we have the spiritual gift of worry. God, I trust you, but I really need to hold on to this because I'm just not 100% sure. We need to trust. 
And so we need to lay those things down in our lives that are other than God, that prevent us from truly following him as we should. And we need to pick up what he has for us. The first lesson I want us to hear this morning from Abraham is how he responded when God called. God called, and what did Abraham say? Here I am. He didn't say, who, me? He said, here I am. He was available. He made himself. Twice in this text, we see him say, here I am. I am available. How available are we to Jesus when he calls? Is it only on our terms? Is it only when it's convenient for us? Is it only when it makes sense to us? Only when it fits our purpose, or or is pleasing Him the most important thing in your life? Are you one to drop everything to answer, here I am? When God calls, the best way we can answer is, here I am. It's really a matter of priority. What's important to us is pleasing Jesus your top priority. I would say for me, I could do better. Some days I would say that pleasing Jesus is high on my list, as it should be. But just being honest and transparent, some days I'm not sure it's as high as it should be on my list. And so really our goal needs to be, must be, that we have more days that we're focused on pleasing Him than days that we're not. We're human. We're going to fail. I get that. But our goal should be to make pleasing Jesus the most important thing in our lives every day. When God calls, are we available? When God calls, make yourself available. That's what Abraham did. He didn't hide. He didn't say, I didn't. That must have been God talking to someone else. There must be other Abrahams in the room because I don't think he was talking to me. He made himself available. He said, here I am. That's what we need to do. When God calls, make yourself available. We need to pick up what he is calling us to. Abraham, it is clear was focused on pleasing God, no matter the cost, no matter what God called him to do, he was, he was focused on making sure that he pleased God. What was important to him was not his own desires, but truly making sure he followed God's desires. This was more important than his, his own wish for a son. This was more important than his desire for a legacy even more important than the life of his son. Pleasing God was his primary focus. As I prepared for our time together today, I had this question in my mind, does God still call us? Does God still call out to us? And and I have to say yes in so many different ways. Directly through his spirit, through others, through moments in prayer. And as we talked about just a few weeks ago, prayer is talking and listening. God calls out to us. He has a plan for us, but more than anything else, he speaks to us. He calls out to us through here, through his word. Are we listening? Are we looking for what he calls us to do? Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, he tells us that our command, the greatest command, is to love God with all that we have, with all of our minds, with all of our hearts, with all of our strength. And the second, he said, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He gives us a commission. He says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've taught you. He's calling out to us. He says, I have a plan for you. This is how you are to live your life. This is how you should please me. 
In John chapter four and Matthew chapter nine, he talks about the fields are white unto harvest, but the workers are what? Few. He calls out to us. Are we available to him? John chapter nine, he says, we need to work while it's still day because there's night is coming when no one can work. These are just some of the ways that he calls out to us. Are we available? We need to pick up this mission that he has called us to. We've talked uh, numerous times about the idea of the church having a mission and, and I want us to understand it a little differently. It's not that the church has a mission, it's God's mission has a church. God's mission is to win the world for Christ. He doesn't wish, First Peter, he doesn't wish anyone to perish. And the church is his tool, his mission to bring about hope to a world that desperately needs it. Have you watched the news lately? Whether they know it or not, people need hope. And the only place they're going to find it is in Jesus. And we have that hope. And so he calls us. Do you hear him calling us? The world needs Jesus. Who's going to tell them? He's calling us. Are we available? We need to pick up this vision, this dream that God has for us. It's on your bulletin. We are a family of compassionate Jesus followers sharing Christ and growing in faith together. That's who we are. That's who he's called us to be. We are to be a church that people outside these walls know that if you want to know Jesus, if you want to grow in your faith, if you want to grow deeper in your understanding of who Jesus is, this is the place to do it. In 2022, that's what we rolled out. I, we, we had this big buildup that we're going to roll out the vision, and then afterwards people came to me and said, we thought you were going to say something about building a building or some other grandiose thing. All you're telling us to do is the things we ought to be doing anyway. Novel concept. Are we going to be the church that picks up what God has called us to do? We need to play our part in what God wants for this church, what God wants for each of us to grow in our faith. You see, the church doesn't flourish if the individual members are suffering. Each of us have a, has a part to play. Each of us needs to be focused on our own spiritual health. Are we spending time in God's word, in prayer, in service? Are we growing in our faith? Are we more like, I like to say it this way, are we more like Jesus today than we were a year ago? You don't have to answer that, but I want you to think about it. Am I more like Jesus today than I was a year ago or 10 years ago or two weeks ago? Are we growing in our faith? God has called us to pick up his mission. One of the things that you hear us talk about, and we haven't done a good job, I will say, I'll own, I'll own this. We have not done a good job over the last a year or so to really keep this in front of us, to, to remind us of the importance. So I want to remind us today, back in 2022, we rolled out this idea that we want to become, over the next five to six years, become truly the church that God wants us to be, the church that people outside these walls know is a group of believers that truly wants to make a difference, a group of believers that want to go deep, that want to have roots planted in God's word, to truly be his disciples and follow him. And so we had this idea to make that tangible. I mean, that, that's a, a wonderful idea, right? We want to be more like Jesus. That, that's easy to say. We can even put it on a t-shirt. I want to be more like Jesus. But how do we do that? And, and so we came up with an idea to make it tangible, and we threw out this goal of a million moments. Anybody remember that? Anybody? anybody? Four. Okay, good. <laughs> a 
This idea that, that years, the older I get, this becomes more and more vivid to me. Have you thought about the years that are behind? As we get older, we think those pass, they seem to pass much more quickly. But years are made up of months and days. And days are made up of minutes and moments. And what happens to us so often is we get overwhelmed with becoming more like Jesus that we don't think about the fact that it's just putting moments together. Some may be called to go to seminary and study and spend years truly learning more about following Jesus. But for most of us, that can seem a little much. But when we think about 10 minutes here, 30 minutes here, two minutes here, when we start having these moments and we string those moments together, they become habits. And habits, spiritual habits, spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines, that is the fabric by which God can transform our lives. And so we have this idea of a million moments that our church family will have between now and 2028, which is when we will celebrate our 150th anniversary as a church in Corpus Christi, Texas. 150 years of following Jesus in Corpus Christi. And so you may remember this, you may not, but back in 2022, we put together a video that kind of explained how we're going to reach this million moments because many were saying, well, that's just impossible. It's really not. It's really not. So I want to show that video again to remind us how we can make moments. One million moments. Sounds like a lot, but is it? Let's break it down. Let's use even a higher number. One million two hundred and thirty four thousand eight hundred moments over six years. That would be two hundred and five thousand eight hundred total moments per year. Let's assume 350 people attend our church regularly. That brings us to 592 moments per person per year. Now, this breaks down per person into 12 moments per year of investing with our time and our finances, and another 12 moments per year of inviting someone to church or to a church activity. Add four mentoring moments each month, leading others through life's challenges. And finally, five moments each week in God's Word during personal Bible study, group Bible study, and Sunday morning worship. And then five faith conversations each week in our homes, with our friends, and even on social media. That's it. So if each of us commit to 592 moments per year in six years, we will have reached our goal of 1,234,800 moments. God has a dream for us. Will we make it our dream? How are we doing on that? Are we spending time in God's Word each week? You're here today. That counts as a moment. If you'll stay in just a moment and go to Bible study, there will be a moment. You may have two or three, actually, in that time frame with conversations and Bible study, prayer. It's really not that hard when we think about it. When we break it down, it's just a big number and a big goal, a God-sized dream, we would say. But are we doing that? Are we spending time? Are we making those moments, truly reading God's Word, praying, listening, having conversations with our friends, with our neighbors, with our coworkers here at church? Are we inviting people to come and be a part of what God is doing here? Are we investing with our offerings, our money, but also our time and our, our talents? Those are the ways that we will meet this dream. Are we picking that up? 
Have we laid down what is keeping us from truly following Jesus, and are we picking up the ways that he's called us to truly serve him, to follow him? As part of this family, you are part of his mission. So my challenge for us today is to lay down those things that are not of God and pick up his mission for your life. That's what Abraham did. Serving God, pleasing him, took priority over everything else, even his son, his only son. Are we willing to make ourselves available and truly pick up what he's calling us to do? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your call on our lives, and you've made it very clear through your word that we are called to be your children, your disciples, and that we are to make our lives about following you, pleasing you, and making disciples of others. And so today, I pray that you would remind us that we need to lay down whatever it is in our lives that is preventing us from truly being devoted to you. And in its place, pick up this dream, your mission for us to grow in our understanding and our faith and for us to make disciples of others. Be glorified in what we do here. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. In just a moment, we'll stand for a time of response. I don't know how God is working on you in this Maybe it's just to simply stay right where you are and recommit to say, God, I will follow you. I want to lay down everything in my life that is not not helping me get closer to you and pick up those things that will. If there's a decision you'd like to make, I will be here, Ginger will be here, Micah will be here. Allow God to move in your hearts as we stand and sing together. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew that I may love what Thou dost love and do.
Go and go ahead and have a seat. We got a few announcements for you. Uh, things coming up here. The first one is if you are interested in joining the choir for Christmas time here at First Baptist, it's a wonderful time. Uh, there is a special Saturday rehearsal. Please be there. It's going to be 9 o'clock. As far as I'm concerned, that's the only extra rehearsal y'all will have um, until maybe it's closer to time. But if you're interested, please show up for that. Uh, it'll be a blessing to us. Also, we are starting a new Bible study class. This is for young married couples. We're saying newlywed and nearly wed. So if that is you, we would love for you to get plugged in with that. Um, Stephen and Rebecca Coretta will be leading that class for us. And we're really excited to be able to minister to some more of the young couples that are coming into our church. And our next announcement is, I'm not exactly sure what it is. There it is. Uh, women's Banquet. So the Women's Banquet, we have Rita Lawson, which is going to be a great time. She'll be speaking for us. And it's October 3rd, Joe's Crab Shack, over on the Tea Heads. The tickets are only available after the services. Um, we do not have an online option for that right now. So if you want to buy a ticket for it, please do that after the service over here in the hallway. We'll have a table set up for you to do that. And also, <clears throat> uh, tonight is the night that we are serving uh, at the Station Church with Missions for Life. It's our local missions organization here at the church. So if you are interested in doing that today, we are meeting here at the church at 5.30 um, to carpool. And if you just want to meet us there at the station, you can be there at 6 to serve. So, Pastor Brian. Thank you. Thank you. What a glorious day. Amen. We started with baptism, and now we get to greet some new folks into our church. And I say new, not so new. Uh, I'm going to start, if you'll allow me, with Miss Nora. Nora came to see me, and you can come with your parents. You don't have to come by yourself, I promise. Uh, this is hard to do, folks, just so you know. This isn't for everybody or the faint of heart. And so I'm really proud of Nora for coming forward today. We got to visit earlier about two weeks ago, and uh, she has made a decision to follow Jesus, and she's coming today to make that public and let you know that Jesus is her Savior and Lord and coming for baptism. And so, Nora, we're very proud of you, and we're glad that you've made this decision. Also today, we have the Woolsey family. If you'll come, this is Greg and Anita, and you recognize them. They've been a part of our family for quite some time in different ways. And so they will be coming uh, from a sister church in our area. So wonderful to have you today. And then also the Taylors are coming. This is Phil and Marilyn, and they came from up north, Wisconsin. And so um, what's that? <laughs> so we're really glad they're coming uh, from uh, Grace Church in Racine, Wisconsin. And so we got a chance to, uh, to meet a couple of weeks ago as well. And so thank you for your patience. I know we didn't have uh, an invitation last week and you were all chomping at the bit to do this then. Um, we made you wait, but thank you for your patience. And so as I always ask, if you are willing as a church family to accept them into this family, to pray for them, to walk alongside them, to be the family that they need, would you say, welcome home? Welcome home. Amen. I'm going to ask them to stand here. I'm going to invite you to come by and greet them. I will be in the Welcome Center and would love to greet you there as well. Thank you for being here today. Uh, as we are dismissed today, may the God who created us with a purpose, Remind us today that we need to get rid of all the things that are other than him so that we can truly focus on serving him every single day. May we be about that. Amen. We are dismissed. Amen.